Welcome to Delphi Baptist Church. Before we begin this morning, I want to make sure that everybody understands our announcement that we have. Um, VBS Vacation Bible School starts tomorrow. No. No, <laughs> no wrong. Next week. The week after. I'm sorry, not tomorrow. The week after. There's a meeting today, right after church. I got that right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Also, we do not have anybody to take care of feeding the children, and we do not have anybody to take care of the crafts. So I would like for everybody to pray about that. We need two people before Vacation Bible School starts. If you would like to volunteer, please uh, see Cindy or, or anybody uh, on the staff and let us know that you would be willing to do that. <clears throat> Today we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Now I know that we do this once a month. Every, every first of the month we do the Lord's Supper. But today we're going to do it a little bit different. Parents, you will decide uh, whether your children should partake of the Lord's Supper today. If you want to open your Bibles, we're going to be turning to chapter, Matthew chapter 26. Matthew tells us in chapter 26, verse 17, that it was the first day of unleavened bread, the feast of unleavened bread. So the disciples came and asked Jesus, where do you want us to prepare the Passover meal for you? Now, the Jewish calendar was filled with religious celebrations. Many of them involved feasting or eating. The Feast of Pentecost was to commemorate God's provision at harvest time. It's like our Thanksgiving. Feasts. The Feast of Booths was to commemorate the Israelites wandering for 40 years in the wilderness and how God pro pro uh, provided temporary housing and how they were dependent upon God for everything. The Day of Atonement was like the High Holy Day to have once a year sacrifices offered in the Holy of Holies. There were many uh, other feasts, but perhaps the most central feast to the Jewish year was the Feast of Passover, or the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It was an eight-day celebration, with one day being the Feast of Passover and the other days called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Both of these feasts reminded the people of God's great hand in delivering them from their slavery and oppression in Egypt. The Feast of Unleavened Bread was named after the type of bread that they were to take with them when they left Egypt. Now, ordinary bread in that day, like today, used leaven to cause it to rise. The bread we're eating today is unleavened bread, and it's made exactly the same way it was made in Jesus' time. Throughout Scripture, leaven is used to represent influence, usually evil influence. Therefore, the Israelites were to leave Egypt and all the evil associated with it and with that place, and not take any leaven with them when they traveled. As a reminder of that event, every year after that, they would remove all leaven from their homes and eat only unleavened bread for seven days of the feast. The custom was that each household would select a lamb to be sacrificed and eaten on the tenth day of the first month before the actual Passover meal. This would have been a Monday of Passover week during the Last Supper of Jesus. And so the disciples probably chose a lamb on that Monday when Jesus had made his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. 
perhaps they kept it until Passover at Mary and Martha's house in Bethany where they were staying. So the disciples came to Jesus probably early on Thursday morning to ask, where do you want us to prepare the Passover meal for you? What was needed to be prepared? As I mentioned, they would have already had the lamb selected, but there were other preparations uh, to do as well. Their to-do list would have included have the lamb slaughtered by a priest at the temple, which could only be done between the hours of 3 and 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Then they would have had to buy unleavened bread, wine, bitter herbs, and a special dip for the Passover meal. Then they would have also had to find a location to celebrate the Passover. Now, Matthew doesn't give us very much information about what happens next, but Luke does. Turn over to Luke 22. Starting with verse 8, we find that Jesus asked Peter and John to go and prepare the Passover meal so we can eat it together. They ask where he wants them to do this, and his response must have sounded pretty strange. He said, as soon as you enter Jerusalem, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him. At the house he enters, say to the owner, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up. That is where you should prepare our meal. You can almost imagine the response. Uh, okay, so you want us to go to the city and find a stranger carrying a pitcher of water and follow him to a stranger's house and tell him that we want to use his home to eat the Passover. Yes, that's what I said. The man carrying the pitcher was likely a servant, and they found him just as Jesus said they would. They followed him back to the house where they spoke to the owner. They told him of his mission to procure a location for the Passover meal. So what about us? How do we prepare for this time that we're going to spend with the Lord today? We read in the Bible that there was a problem very early in the early church when people not preparing to take uh, appropriate care as they were involved in the Lord's Supper. One church in Corinth was known for being flippant and lacking proper etiquette with regard to participating in this meal. Paul, writing and rebuking them, points out that they were not only eating the Lord's Supper because when they came to, together they were rude, selfish, and thinking only of themselves. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 11.27 says, Anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthy is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Why? Because the cup and the bread represent what Jesus did for us on the cross. That's why the passage says, that each person needs to stop and examine himself before they eat the bread or drink the cup. Now that does not mean that if we have sin in our lives, we cannot partake of the Lord's Supper. It just means that we need to take a deep look inside ourselves and admit that we have sin in our lives. Don't try to hide it. Don't try to deny it. Admit it to God and ask for forgiveness. We must admit that we are sinful and that we in and of ourselves are not worthy of God's blessings. As a matter of fact, what we do deserve is God's wrath. This part of the Lord's Supper called preparation is a time to reflect and to admit just how sinful we really are. We're not worthy none of us, to have communion or to have a relationship with God. Can you admit that today? Just as important as buying the groceries for the meal or finding the place or preparing our hearts and reminding us is preparing our hearts and reminding us what Jesus has done for each of us. One way to prepare your heart is to offer a simple, silent prayer 
You can do that today, right there in your seat as we continue on with our service. You can privately now admit to God your sins against him. It might be your failure to pray or to read your Bible. It might be your failure to put your trust in him. It might be that you're not listening and obeying his commands. Maybe you need to admit to God your sins against others. Maybe it's your lack of compassion or your impatience with other people. Maybe you've hardened your heart toward people in your life, your friends, your relatives. Just ask God to prepare your heart for, for, for receiving what God has for you today. Billy? <clears throat> Could I ask our deacons to please come forward at this time and pass out the bread? <clears throat> <clears throat> Bible tells us in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus <clears throat> took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The Bible tells us in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus reclined around the table with his disciples. We can imagine as they walked up the old dust-covered stairs to the upper room that they could see the meal already set up for them. They would have sat on pillows on the floor at a low table. The smell of freshly cooked lamb would have been strong in the air and, and perhaps there were some flies that were flying around as they swatted away from the food. The table was set and now it was time for the moment of intense intimacy. Now it's hard for us to relive such a moment as this in a setting like we have here today. It was customary at the Passover meal to have the head of the family break the bread and say a blessing over the bread. The blessing was like this. Blessed art thou, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. 
But at the Last Supper, Jesus, as head of this family, having given thanks for the bread, added words which gave the bread a new significance. Jesus said, Take this and eat it, for it is my body. The fact that he broke the bread does not imply that his body was broken on the cross. Matter of fact, the Bible's very clear about that. As a fulfillment of prophecy, not a bone was broken in his body. Jesus broke the bread and said, this is my body given for you. Jesus alluded to the fact that he was the bread of life several times in the Gospel of John. Chapter 6, verse 45, he says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus wants us to eat this bread in remembrance of the fact that he is the bread of life. As we trust in him, we invite him into our lives. As we eat this bread, we're remembering the sacrifice for us on the cross, giving his body for our sins. Now, some traditions believe that the bread literally becomes the body of Jesus in some supernatural way. Others believe while the bread doesn't actually turn into the, the body of Jesus, there's a supernatural presence around the bread where the bread is not literally Jesus, but present. He's present in a very real way. We, however, take the perspective that Jesus is using the bread as a metaphor the same way he said, I am the vine or I am the door. Billy? Billy? 